Um, so hello everyone, I'm Li Jiaxu. Um, I'm the research director for the Food System Smart City Research Focus Area. And also I'm the group manager for the Scalable Computation Returns Group at TAC. The Good System is a UT grant challenge whose mission is to developing human AI partnerships that benefit societies. Smart cities technology has great potential to contribute to these missions. So to advance our knowledge and research around smart cities, and we have a start this lighting presentation series. Uh, so for today, we are delighted to have a work of Scott Henson. Scott is a chief technology officer at the Pecan Street Lab, and his research has been supported by a number of public agencies and private firms, such as NSF, DOE, Federal Highway uh, Administrations, and uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, and so on. Uh, so for today, uh, Scott's talk will be more focused on his work at Pecan Street. Scott, I will turn that over to you now. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, so thank you for having me. Um, uh, as Wei just said, I'm the CTO of Pecan Street. We are currently uh, focused on three areas of uh, data collection and field trials. Um, you see those uh, here. We have uh, growing work. We're probably gonna have to add uh, two more columns to this. Uh, we've added some work um, in uh, agricultural uh, carbon sequestration, soil carbon sequestration, um, and as well uh, as uh, energy equity and race issues. So we may add uh, a couple of more columns uh, to this slide in, in the future. Um, we are best known um, for our data collection work, but we also do a lot of uh, field trials um, and program development and execution. So what this means is we've got a number of folks that uh, uh, volunteer graciously to allow us into their homes with various sorts of monitoring equipment. Uh, we get a baseline on those homes and then we start coming back later uh, and we add technology to those homes uh, that is either stuff that we've developed um, in conjunction with uh, other groups. Like we've got a, a, a program right now with uh, funded by RPE with University of Michigan, where we're doing some uh, advanced controls work on uh, thermostatic controlled loads. So for, for us, that means air conditioners. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, and, and we do we do these field trials, then we, we have the data sets to, to show how effective or how ineffective the technology was. Uh, so what data do we collect? We collect, uh, for energy data, we collect whole home, solar, and as many sub-circuits as possible. So in an average residential structure, you'll have 20 to 36 um, sub-circuits. So when you go to that circuit panel and, and, and you're looking down the rows and they're almost always mislabeled, but you know you see lighting and kitchen and this, that, and the other thing. We actually go in and we put a, a measurement uh, transducer on each one of those. Uh, and that allows us to see at a very granular level what's happening with um, energy usage and electricity within the home. And we actually get all these measurements at a one second interval. So we have homes that generate 10 and a half plus million points of data a day, which means across our whole energy data field bed, uh, test bed, we get about 2.6 billion data points a day. Um, that's a lot. And whenever I talk about this, especially with uh, more traditional utilities um, and folks like that, uh, their, their, their question is how do we do this? Uh, because we're only a 12 person team and this seems like a monumental uh, data collection and organization task to them. Uh, and why, <laughs> why do we do this? Um, I already talked a little bit about the how, um, uh, but the why uh, is, is really important for smart homes and smart um, operations of uh, distributed energy systems. So as an example, I put this slide together uh, or this, this plot together. Um, and the purple dot is what the utility knows about any given home at any given period of time uh, about their energy usage. They average the total energy over that 15 minute period. And so for that 15 minutes, they said that home used just over two and a half uh, uh, kilowatts uh, for that period of time. And then they, they multiply that times 0.25, they get their kilowatt hours, they can send you the bill for the 
uh, and, and it's very accurate. The meter is actually very accurate, but it has very low temporal resolution. So for years, we measured at one minute. And this enabled you to see a lot more, right? But it was still aliasing out a lot of things that, that were interesting and happening in the home. So that's why we moved to the one second, which is the, the blue line. So now you can see how dynamic that home was. If you just looked at the utility in, um, information, you'd think that that house um, only consumed, or that house con uh, consumed roughly you know, 2.3, 2.4 kilowatts. When in fact, at times it was over six, and at other times it was roughly one. And so um, those interaction between devices, um, especially as you go for, um, and this is uh, sort of fresh on my mind because of the, the winter storms, um, if you go to smaller uh, resiliency hub type systems where you've got maybe four homes backed up by a generator or four homes backed up by a battery or even one home, you have to account for this very dynamic movement in energy usage. Whereas if you looked at a thousand homes on a feeder, um, it actually tends to all average out and move much slower. Okay. And so um, as we try and make smarter decisions about how and when we're using energy at smaller areas, um, then, then higher resolution data becomes more important. How has this data been used in the past? Well, uh, one of the things that we've done is we've actually gotten um, folks uh, like utilities in uh, Minnesota, California, uh, and even Austin Energy to allow solar to be installed at what, what used to be considered a non-optimal orientation. Uh, when I first got started in the, in the renewables energy business years and years and years ago, uh, um, you were lucky if you could buy solar modules at $6 a watt. Right now they're selling for like at wholesale prices, they're selling at like 35 or 50 cents a watt. Um, and, and so to maximize production, it used to be required that you had to pay, face those solar modules south if you're in the Northern hemisphere or north if you're in the Southern hemisphere because that maximizes your overall yearly production. Well, it turns out that although that maximizes the overall yearly production, the value of energy, the cost of the energy uh, offset by that solar production isn't all that great because especially in those sort of earlier morning times and air conditioning use isn't quite as rampant, um, the electricity is just not that expensive. If you're willing to lose 10% of your yearly production and you face those panels west, then all of a sudden the value of electricity generated by the solar modules greatly exceeds the lost output because of the non-optimal angle, right? So we've actually gotten utilities to change um, um, how they rebate and how they, where they allow these things. And in fact, it, um, it turns out if you face them west, it helps with the duck curve problem. If you, if you research California solar, they're always talking about the duck curve um, and, and, it, and it actually helps with that problem. What else have we used this data for? Well, when COVID hit, and I'm broadcasting from my garage today, uh, when COVID hit, uh, one of the very first things that we did is we dug into the data to see how people's behavior was changing. And we saw a 90% drop in electric vehicle charging the day after uh, Mayor Adler issued the stay at home orders. Now it has creeped back up, right? And so um, over time, in fact, you can see that sort of, I need to replot this for an entire year since we have that data now. Um, but you can see um, how it has, has creeped back up. Um, but what, and what we did is we actually started to look at it and say, all right, they're, they are using, or they're charging the vehicle more, but are they actually going places and staying there or what's happening? And we actually don't think that's the case. We actually think that they're using the vehicle to do like curbside pickup or make a short shopping, shopping trip run and come right back home because the charging pattern of when those vehicles are charging has changed. And we can see that because we know when it starts by the second. And since we measure the, everything else in the house, we can see the behavior of all the other appliances, the TVs, the lights, um, the uh, refrigerator, things like that. And that usage hasn't really shifted since it was, there was a massive shift when the stay at home orders um, were issued, but it hasn't really shifted since then that has stayed relatively constant. So we think what's happening is, is people are more comfortable to go out and make a quick shopping run, but they're not going out and staying out, at least amongst our volunteer participants. And then the last example that I'll give you is um, a field trial where we actually took control of the device. Um, and these plots, I, I, 
I, I struggle and struggle on sort of um, how to plot this so that it becomes really clear what I did. Um, basically, I monitored a cluster of two houses, one of which had solar and one of which um, uh, uh, had an electric vehicle. And when the house that had solar had excess production, I changed the charge rate on the electric vehicle. I built something that, that would enable me to change the charge rate of the electric vehicle. And so um, what this did, and you can sort of see how they mirror image each other. I didn't, I didn't ever let the vehicle go to no charging because I, I didn't want the, the range to be reduced uh, when the person wanted it to, to be fully charged by. But um, I did able to ramp up. So on the, the graph on the left here, you see the green and the blue. And notice how the green never drops below a certain amount, but it also sort of mirrors the excess solar production that happens. So between 1130 and one, there's a lot of excess solar production and that's mirrored in the, in the electric vehicle um, uh, charging. And what that does is that if you take the, just that one house that has solar, it actually goes negative during the day, right? So it flips around and starts pushing all, or starts pushing SX, excess power back to the grid. Well, that, that, that can cause um, challenges for grid operators if that happens on wide enough scales with big enough power and, and, and variety of areas and fast enough. And so what I wanted to do is show that if I just had this one very flexible load, that I could eliminate that. So if, if I didn't control the charging on the graph on the right, you see how there's that short period in the middle of the day where the, the red line goes below zero. And that shows that it did it did it would have pushed charge back or pushed um, energy back onto the grid. The green line, however, never goes negative, and that helps because that that is very helpful for the grid. Because now, actually, what I've done is I've I've reduced the peak in the afternoon and I've brought the minimum back up. So instead of having to design the grid to handle these massive swings, I've narrowed the amount of energy usage. And I've made the load much more firm, and that has value to the electric utilities. So I have I have gone through that very very quickly, um, and I'm hoping that there's questions. Scott, I have a quick question. Sure. Maybe a stupid question. So, is that possible for Pecan Street user to try the their electricity generated by PV within the community? Yes, the users, the, the volunteer participants have access to their data. Um, but we've, we've seen some um, fairly typical human habits, which is when they get access to the data, it's a shiny new thing and they log on and they look at it relatively regularly when it's brand new and then they stop. Okay, uh, a follow-up. <laughs> I say that, and that's the vast majority of folks. There are a few participants, I would say probably 20 or so, that we know are active users. They are constantly looking at it. And we know this because if there's ever an issue um, in the systems, uh, they are often one of the first people to tell us even before our own automated checks find it. Hey, I think something's broken. <laughs> do, do they... Do they change their behavior after they saw their data or they just keep doing what they're doing? Um, uh, it depends. Uh, some folks have, uh, some folks clearly have. Um, I wish uh, the very first time I had an energy monitoring system, it was a different energy monitoring system than we use now. And we don't have the data from my house anymore from that time. I wish I had saved it because it is a, um, it is a it is a wonderful example of what happens when somebody has information that they can act on. Um, as an electrical engineer, I know what a kilowatt is and what a kilowatt hour costs, right? And I was horrified on a February day where it was like 50 degrees outside, so I wasn't running heat, I wasn't running air conditioner, that my house was drawing almost two and a half kilowatts. And I ran around and I started shutting off lights and I got it down to under 600 watts. And so you could see the beginning of this data where it starts out and then it drops down. I wish I had saved that, right? Now, over the years, because that was probably eight years ago, 
it is clear that my behavior has gone back to closer to what it was where more stuff was residually on because my house rarely goes below about 1200 watts. Scott, that's, a, that's, a, sorry to ask this question. Yeah. That's no, no, a, no, that's, that's, no, no. I mean, that's, that, that's it's, sort it's of so hard. Work. Yeah. It's so hard for other people to understand what a kilowatt is. Do you have a like graphic ranking system? Hey, you are the best person in your community. You use the least energy and you're the worst. No, we don't. Can, can we no, do that? We, don't. we do can not. We, if we, um, it would be interesting to, I think, to do a, um, a project, um, where we sort of um there have been we have seen projects where folks have sort of gamified or competitive uh, yes, competitiveized yeah. Gradu um, that, uh, um yeah. and and we'd love to sort of see to do some of that with with the level of resolution that we have to see if it um uh makes a long-term effect we did a pricing trial years ago where we told people um or we 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 actually did a program where we sort of had accounts, escrow accounts where we held money and, and they could actually earn real money. So it was, it was very effective. Um, but what we found was, is that the behavioral change that were sort of set and forget, those are sticky. Like we still have electric vehicle charging patterns changed six years later because folks went into their vehicle and changed the settings on, I want my vehicle to be done by 6 a.m versus charge immediately they've just never undone that programming change right so so yeah we'd, we'd love to do some more work around that we just have to figure out how to how to fund it okay and and, and i i i have a follow-up question i say two questions so do you think is it possible to do a marketplace using blockchain for a user to trade <clears throat> their electricity within Pecan Street microgrid, like uh, so. If um, you have a solar panel, you get a like extra, like a uh, two kilowatt. I can serve this to you with blockchain, and when you need it, you can sell it back to me. So basically, is that something you're thinking about? Um, yeah. In fact, we've 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 looked at it several times. Um, you know, I will. Uh, you know that transactional energy. Yeah. Um, is is something that we look at and we think is a is a um, uh, a long term probably you know it's going to be something that that just becomes par for the course. It needs to be done in such a way that people still sort of are able to live their lives, right? Nobody's gonna nobody. We have long ago found, especially with air conditioning uh, work, is that if if people get hot and uncomfortable, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, but um, we think that uh, this is something that that is uh, we'd love to do programs around that. Um, you know, I always have concerns as soon as you start talking blockchain and compute power and the energy um, required to actually compute some of these things. Right? Sometimes you know your your overall efficiency gains can be offset by that. Uh, but these these are things that you don't know for sure until you actually try and do it. Allowed to trade within microgrid in Austin. So that's why. So um, yes, no, maybe. Um, <laughs> so um, we wouldn't ever be able to disconnect them from the Austin energy grid, okay? Um, that would violate like laws and stuff. And I'm not real keen on doing that. Um, I general rule of thumb is I try to not break the law. Um, uh, but what we could do is like, like I mentioned before that pricing trial where we put, we set up escrow accounts and we say, all right, well, there's $400 in this account. And then at the end of the program, you know, if you do everything right, we estimate you could have $800 in this and you literally get to keep the $800, right? They're paying their Austin Energy bill all along. They're getting their energy from Austin Energy, right? Um, but their behavior is driven by a monetary incentive that's somewhere else. Um, and and it, it's, it's pretty valid, right? Like it, it does, it has, it has shown to change behavior pretty drastically. Um, uh, when we did the program the first time, there was, there was one volunteer participant where 
um, the husband was all in um, and uh, his wife was not as convinced. And she got so annoyed with his air conditioning settings that she requested to exit the program. <laughs> um, so, um, which of course we let them do, right? I mean, like, we're not gonna hold them hostage. We're like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> You're, you're out. Um, that's, that's, I'm so sorry. And he was like, oh, but I was having fun. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, that is something that we could, we could absolutely do. There are ways to do that, but we do have to be very careful about not running afoul of public utility commission and then uh, local uh, electric code laws. Another thing, sorry to ask a question. Uh, so is that anybody trying to use EUV as a storage battery or oh yeah lots of people potential story battery for their neighborhood mm -hmm. um so oh in in the neighborhood we actually have the the first uh, vehicle to grid uh charger in fact the the picture on the first here uh this uh vehicle to grid system this nissan leaf here uh was part of the austin energy shines program and was the first vehicle to grid system in texas that we know of um and so we are looking at that i'm actually on uh one the the sunspec um working group meetings for vehicle to grid communications charging standard um it's still going to be a while before this is common um because the standards the standards are not keeping up with what the battery technology is capable of and the inverter costs are not quite coming down fast enough. Once it reaches a critical tipping point, the inverter costs will drop. Like, like when we bought that vehicle for the Austin Shines program, the vehicle was $30,000. The charger was $32,000. So the electronics to get it, the at, energy out of the car and into the grid was more than the vehicle. That's obviously not a sustainable thing. That needs to be like a $700 box, right? Um, it can get there. Do you see a significant energy hike because of working from home? Uh, it's about, so the, the yes, no, again, yes, no. Um, the, the, the good news is, is that energy efficiency programs over the years with like energy star appliances and things like that um, mean that the stuff in folks' homes is, pre is pretty efficient. Um, and so, um, you know, especially in the summertime in Texas, the air conditioner can sort of swamp the impacts of staying at home. But when we, because we have that granularity, we can pull out um, the air conditioner and the electric vehicle and say, let's just look at everything else. We, we call that the everything else category. Um, we see that usage is up depending on the month, 20 to 25%. So, I'm, so yeah, I'm asking this is because uh, uh, it's a potential uh, grant uh, trying to see how COVID-19 affect energy use. Uh, the underlying assumption is basically people drive less, uh, people stay at home more, work from home and uh, Zoom more, so they use more power. I, is that a true? That's, that, that's your, happening. That's happened, okay. That's, that, significant. that's all happening. Is Not only that, but uh, like like it's it's impacting refrigerator usage people are grazing the refrigerator more it's impacting um like especially at the beginning of covid we saw changes in sleep patterns um you used to see the houses sort of come alive at about five starting at about 5 30 in the morning and there'd be this ramp rate of usage of stuff in the house well that shifted towards 7 a.m Right, people were on average sleeping an hour and a half ish later, as far as we could tell. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they were staying up later. They were staying up until midnight. Usually, the houses had sort of ramped back down at about ten thirty p.m. They were they were staying up until midnight, right? Um, and so we we you can clearly see major behavior shifts of folks in the houses because of the lockdowns and the the health impacts and things associated with you know, sort of continuing your life and going outside and being around other people. How, how many, how many households do you have volunteered in your program? 500? For the one second data, I think it's about 350. We have more at one minute. Uh, and then we have uh, in grand total with like every device that we've ever installed that's still running uh, probably close to a thousand. But we have about 350 homes with, with really good one second energy data. 
Nice. Okay, um, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I do have one quick question, so if, if you can answer sure. this. Um, I think we are on the we are definitely on the trend to see more and more electric electricity vehicle being used uh, by the people. So over the year, do you see a significant kind of changing of energy consumption pattern from a home due to EV usage and more and more? I think that might be have a bigger impact on the future on both like a residential uh, energy usage, but also maybe impact on how the house and power grid should be designed. Yes, um, the answer is yes, we do see a, a, an impact. Um, there are ways to mitigate that impact. I'm not sure um, that, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking a fairly good amount of energy to put into a car to drive more than you know 30 miles, right? So uh, what we've seen is a general trend is as the electric range has increased, obviously um, people have less range anxiety and are willing to use it more, therefore you have more charging. Right. And as the range of the vehicle increases, if people want that vehicle to be charged um, completely in the morning, the charge rate of the vehicle has to increase. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you have it, you know, a, an early model Chevy Volt with 30 mile electric range um, that, you know, you can charge in three hours with, um, uh, or four hours at three kilowatts. If you've got a newer Tesla, um, we see those charging in houses at up to 16 kilowatts. So five times the power. Uh, and in fact, I don't know if it's live yet. I thought, I think it was going to go live yesterday. I haven't gotten, cause I'm, I'm also on our participant email list at home. I haven't gotten the, the news announcement that we did this yet. Um, but we did an entire uh, study on what happens to prices or you know, your electric costs for the utility is what far what the utility sees and emissions and things like that as people are moving towards larger vehicles with larger battery capacity and faster charge rates. And it, um, the, the team did a fantastic job. Uh, so it's, a, it's an awesome piece of work that they did. So go check that out. Okay. Anybody installed a battery pack in, the, in your community or in your volunteer group? We have we have six energy storage systems for for uh, as part of that Shines program, and we know of a couple of others we think uh, in uh, California that are being used for critical load panels uh, for when they have uh, uh, fire and weather related outages over there. Okay, I think that uh, yeah we have uh, yeah we have to talk again about the potential proposals. I think the awesome. EV the electricity and the transportation coupling is a very hard topic to look at. Yeah, we, we, love, to, we love to partner with folks uh, and especially UT because it's a, a pretty easy partnership um, uh, for us to, to do. We're, since we're in the same town, it, 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 makes it makes things tend to run smoother. Okay. Thank you. Great, great. It's very interesting and a useful talk. Uh, thank you very much again for the time, Scott. And, thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, we definitely can keep in touch on future collaborations with the UT between between UT awesome. and that's great. Um, so for um, everyone else, thanks for coming, and uh, we will have another talk uh, next Tuesday. Uh, hopefully, we can see you again there. Uh, you can follow us through our website, which I post in the chat, the smartcity.tech.utech.edu. Um, um, have a good day. That's all. Thank Bye. you. Bye.